Welcome back to Differential Signaling with RS422, the details. First, I want to talk about terminating RS422 signal lines. Why, when and how. Second, we will have a closer look at the ground connection between an RS222 transmitter and an RS422 transceiver. Why do you need it? Do you really need it? Can you get away without it? Third, does it make sense to galvanically isolate your RS422 transceivers? In which cases is that a good idea and how do you do it? And just maybe some other things will come to my mind too. Anyway, uh, before you dive in, you should really watch Differential Signaling with RS422, The Basics Part 1 card here, link in the description. Enjoy! Let's start with termination. And if you have watched Differential Signaling with RS422, The Basics Part 2, card here, link in the description, you might notice that the notebook is gone and the function generator is back. So my test setup here is reverted to part one of the basic series. Just in case you haven't watched part one of the details or have forgotten about it, here is a short recap. So I have my function generator here, which is churning out a 10 MHz square wave logic level signal, which goes through a 50 ohm coax cable to my left breadboard, where it's terminated with a 50 ohm resistor. And that goes into one half of an ISL8490 transceiver, obviously the transmitter part, and is sent via a twisted pair, yeah, CAT3 cable, 20 meters in length, impedance 100 ohm, over to the right breadboard where it's terminated with a 100 ohm resistor, and then goes into the receiver part of another ISL8490 RS44 transceiver. And out I get a logic level square wave again, hopefully. And the length of 20 meter twisted pair cable is behind my oscilloscope, so it's out of the way. But you see the lines going in here to one breadboard and going in here to the other. Here's how the whole thing looks on the oscilloscope. So I have here the digital input on the left breadboard from my function generator. Then I have here the A and B line signals from my RS422 line, how they end up at the right breadboard. And here's the digital output from the RS422 receiver on the right breadboard. Please note these over and undershoots here are just caused by some parasitic capacitance of the breadboard. Please remember, this high here on the digital input of our transmitter corresponds to that high here on the A line and that low here on the B line and to this high here on the digital output of our receiver. So we saw in the basics that there is a significant signal delay inside the RS422 transceivers. So what will happen if I remove the termination resistor here at the end of my twisted pair? The termination resistor is gone. Uh, I have it here in my fingers. So let's have a look at the oscilloscope. And there we see, well, nothing much. Of course, the signal levels on our A and B line are higher now. The 100 ohm load at the end of the transmission line is gone, but otherwise it's fine. But what happens if we change the frequency a little bit, huh? So that's nine megahertz now and yeah, you see this funny distortions here, huh? Let's go down to 8 megahertz. Yeah, this looks at 7 megahertz almost good again. Now at 6 megahertz, we have a distortion here. At 5 megahertz, yeah, half of 10 megahertz, it's absolutely perfect again. 4 megahertz, yeah, these additional hums. What's going on here? 
To explain that, we just ignore for the moment that we have actually two signal lines with a differential signal on them, because it really doesn't matter. That phenomenon is not specific to differential signaling. It also happens if you only have one signal line or for example a coax cable. We also have to treat our signal now as an electromagnetic wave here in a blue line traveling down our transmission line from the point where it's injected, so our transmitter, down to our receiver where the transmission line ends, all in black. Now, because we don't have a proper termination anymore at the end, a part of the signal coming down here is reflected back in the direction of the transmitter. And if that reflection is out of phase with our signal itself, like I have drawn it here in green, if you add both up, you come to a waveform like that here. So low, low, then the high, little high reflection with the low here, then the high, little high of the reflection with a big high of our signal here, then low reflection, big high here, and so on. And you saw exactly that waveform on the oscilloscope. We come from the lowest low, yeah, the reflection is already adding up here and leading us here to the maximum. So that's actually uh, our original signal plus the maximum of the reflection and then it goes down here to that's our normal signal level and then it falls to our normal low. Of course, that's the picture of a specific phase relation between our signal and the reflection. So if I just modify the frequency here a little, you see how that changes. But anyway, uh, why isn't that happening at, let's say, our original 10 megahertz. Why is the signal there? Uh, well, more or less perfect. The answer is trivial. If our reflection is exactly in phase with our signal and you add both up, you get exactly the same signal form, just with a slightly higher amplitude. And if our reflection is exactly 180 degrees out of phase with our signal, then the highs hit the lows and the lows hit the highs. So our signal form still stays the same, just with a slightly lower amplitude. And we can actually see that on the scope too. So we are at 10 megahertz and I'm going now down with the frequency. And you see the distortion is coming, it's coming and at 7.5 megahertz our signal looks good again but has a higher amplitude. And now we go further down to 5 megahertz, some distortions in between, but when we are exactly at 5 megahertz we have a nice signal again, lower amplitude of course. And you can do this uh, down to 2.5 megahertz, 1.25 megahertz, etc. And because this is one of my dreaded tutorials, I'll treat you to a little bit of math too. I assume you know this relationship here. So lambda, the wavelength of a signal, is equal to the velocity of the signal over its frequency. For a CAT3 cable, the velocity of the electromagnetic signal on it is about 0.6, the speed of light in vacuum. Now, if the length of our cable D is exactly n, n being natural numbers, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., times lambda over 2, then we have a perfect destructive interference, so not that example here, but a destructive interference between our signal blue 
and the reflection. So we still retain the signal form, but at a lower amplitude. But if our cable length D is n times lambda over 2 plus lambda over 4, then we have a constructive interference. That is, our blue signal is reflected exactly in phase, what I've shown you here, and we get retain the signal form, but at a higher amplitude. Little disclaimer at that point, you have to take these drawings here with a little grain of salt because in nature uh, electromagnetic waves are not really square waves, but these square waves we see on the oscilloscope are made up by a combination of several sine waves of different frequencies. So sine waves like I at least tried to draw here. So that's physics and that's uh, idealized. But that doesn't explain why a proper termination resistor, so with the same ohm value as the impedance of your transmission line, alleviates that problem. And yes, I've inserted the termination resistor of 100 ohms again. And just to prove to you that this little resistor really eliminates the reflections, uh, we are at 5 megahertz. So that was a good signal, but now I'm turning up the frequency again. So six, seven megahertz, eight megahertz, and nine megahertz, and we're back at 10 megahertz. Yeah, no distortions through reflections. Anyway, the explanation I'm going to give you is simplified to a fault, uh, so very crude and probably in some aspects wrong. But at least it will give you a feel of what's going on here. We have here our signal source and that's our transmission line with the impedance Z0. While impedance is also measured in ohms, we use here the letter Z and not the letter R like for a DC resistance. And then we have here our termination or our load at the end of the transmission line also with the impedance ZL for load. If the impedance of our transmission line is equal to the impedance of our termination or our load, then two things are true. First, of course, the power dissipated. Yeah, that's a little bit a crude thing to say. In the transmission line is exactly equal to the power dissipated here in our termination or load. And second, the power in our load we can get out with a given signal source is at its maximum. There's actually a video where I characterize my cheap function generator uh, somewhere over there. And in this video, this is explained in more detail. Card here, link in the description. But if Z0 is smaller than ZL, the following is true. First, the power dissipated in the transmission line is of course smaller than the power dissipated in our termination or whatever is at the end of our transmission line. And secondly, the power dissipated or received here at the end is smaller than the maximum power we could receive here when Z0 is equal to ZL. So far everything was absolutely correct, but now comes a, <laughs> a little semantic gap and jump. So if we look at that case and we say, okay, we're transferring here through the signal line a lot of power in form of uh, electromagnetic wave and only a smaller part of that power is here absorbed again in our termination or our load at the end of the line, then where does the difference go? And the answer is it's reflected back towards our signal source. Yeah, very crude explanation, okay? I'm aware of that, but now you have an idea what's going on. So if 
that power flow is exactly equal to that power flow. Like in our first case here, of course, we have no power left to reflect back towards our signal source. Let's close up this chapter with some specifics about RS-422 termination. Because up to now we were talking about terminating signal lines, differential or not in general. RS-422 actually allows you to use no termination when certain conditions are met. First, your baud rate has to be smaller than 200 kilobits per second. And second, the length of your transmission line has to be relatively short. The condition here is that the time for your data rate, so uh, that's one over your baud rate, is greater than four times the time delay on your transmission line. So the TR for 200 kilobits per second would be five microseconds. And the T delay, which is the length of your transmission line D over the velocity, how your signal propagates over that transmission line, would be d over 0.6 the speed of light. That's for cat 3 twisted pair cable. So d over 0.6 times 300 million meter per second. That's d times 0.00556 microseconds per meter. And we take our five microseconds, divide that by four, and we divide that by our here uh, speed on the transmission line. We get to a maximum distance of 225 meters at 200 kilobits per second. Looking again at this graph here, which I've already shown in the basics, I already carded that link in the description, by EEGRW, Creative Common License, link also in the description, we see that at 200 kilobits per second, we can use a cable length of almost 600 meters. So not terminating stuff has its drawbacks. But it also has one advantage. Not having that termination resistor at the end of your transmission line means that your line driver or your transmitter doesn't have to work that hard. In any case, if you don't meet these two conditions, you have to use termination. And the standard here is to use a terminating resistor that has the same value as the impedance of your transmission line. There are two more termination techniques used with RS-422, which I will mention but not go into the details. First, there's AC termination. So instead of just using a termination resistor at the end of your transmission line, you use an RC element. The advantage is you put less strain on your line driver transmitter, more strain of course uh, than compared to having no termination at all. Signal quality is not as good as with a classical termination with a resistor. Second, there is multipoint termination where, as the name implies, you put a termination on several points of your transmission line. Big drawback here, a lot of load on your line driver transmitter. Advantage in some configuration that will yield you a very good signal quality. If you want to know more about the whole stuff, there is a very good Texas Instruments application report. I put a link in the description. That's it for today. Next up, point to multipoint transmissions. So one transmitter sending a signal to several transceivers. I didn't mention that in the intro, but it came to my mind while I was talking at the very end about multi-point termination. And we will revisit that issue too. I already have another length of CAT3 twisted pair cable at hand. Uh, yeah, especially for that purpose. So we'll have a lot of fun. Till next time, bye.